Noel Briscoe, who lives in Atlanta, has been collecting obits for over 50 years. He says his collection is a way of savoring people after they're gone. Every day I pick up the New York Times, the USA Today, and I have a subscription to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Oh, Richard Todd, dashing actor, dies at 90. Richard Todd was the uh, person who played the Reverend Peter Marshall in that wonderful movie, A Man Called Peter. He preached here in Atlanta. So let's just tear this out. One time, oh, last year, I decided I was going to see, just for my own curiosity, how many obituaries I collected in a month's time. Four hundred and something in a month's time. Oh, I'm, I'm addicted. There's no two ways about it. Thirty-something notebooks and several hundred in each notebook. And see, I've got boxes full of loose obits. Now here is one, Margaret W. Pepperdine, 89, for 53 years, scholar, nurtured students. She was like my high school history teacher. We don't see obituaries like about teachers like that much anymore. Even though I didn't know these people, I feel a link to them. If I'm fortunate enough to have a, an obit written for me, they will say, Noel Briscoe, the archivist of death, dies. <laughs> we tend to think of zoos as places where animals live, but they're also places where animals die. And we have this tribute from the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Each of the three arapaimas were found dead in the morning, resting on the bottom of the pool. We're talking about fish seven or eight feet long. Joe Gibbon um, was euthanized just a few weeks ago. Polynesis was a wonderful shrew, and he was active right up until his last day. Merlin was a very special soft bear. At the age of 27, we considered him to be the equivalent of a person that's in their 90s. Even still, I mean, I don't think any of us were prepared for it. The collection's aging all the time because that's what living collections do. Every animal is going to die someday. It's never easy. It doesn't matter how the animal dies. It doesn't matter how old it is or how young it is. It's never easy. You get used to it but you don't get used to it. And the minute you get completely hardened to it, and that's when it's time to leave the zoo world. Baruch Levi Bloom was born earlier this month in Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital. He lived for 10 minutes. And though it was too short a life for an obituary, his mother found a way to memorialize him. Mary Beth Kirshner brings us their story. Joanna Bloom had known for months that she wanted a photographer to be there at the birth of her baby son. Doctors did not expect him to live. On December 1st, Joanna had an emergency C-section. Her husband was sitting at her side, holding her hand. There was a blur of activity in the operating room. And I looked towards the wall, and I saw this really unassuming figure dressed up in a, in a gown, her face covered, and she was holding the camera in her hand. Doctors whisked Joanna's 2-pound, 11-ounce baby away and they struggled to keep Baruch Levi Bloom alive for 10 long minutes. He had a birth defect of the brain and his heart had failed. His tiny body was brought to Joanna in the recovery room. Ashley Hutchison was there too. When I walked into the room where Joanna was with her son, she looked up at me and we locked eyes and kind of looked at each other and there was a, a small smile from both of us and said to her, wow, he looks beautiful. He's pretty beautiful. Oh. When I start taking pictures, it's like I'm not there. So Joanna looked down at her son, and that was that they were having their moment, and I was in the background, and it's that simple. 
Uh, it almost felt as though uh, we were not holding a baby, but uh, as though we were holding an angel. You know, in years to come, this is not going to become some fuzzy memory, but that this indeed was a very, very real moment. And I wrote her back and I said, thank you. You've taught me a lot about strength and courage, as did your son. She told me that I've I've become part of her family in such a profound way that I'll never know. And who was an anchor of his community, notable for so many reasons, but not famous. Ernie Manuelito died this year at the age of 57, after almost 40 years behind a microphone. When Ernie spoke, in English or in Navajo, his voice carried across the Red Rock Desert and into the ears of the Navajo Nation. Ernie's voice was very familiar. It's just like a the voice of Walter Cronkite. He was the first voice that came on the air when the radio station started here in Wind Rock. Good evening, I'm Ernie Mandolito with K. Kinnan Radio Station. One of the and he stayed on here with us until he left us. <laughs> 